In this episode, I am joined by Steve Donahue, writer, nationally published book critic, and popular YouTuber. Steve details his remarkable daily routine in which he sleeps 90 minutes a night and devotes vast amounts of time to reading and writing. He recalls his Jesuit education and reveals the intellectual doctrines at the heart of the religious order famed for its rigor and learning. Steve reflects on the healing power of high states of concentration, the art of memory and how to train it, and considers the threats posed to human attention by social media and smartphones. Steve considers strategies for more effective reading, how to grapple with difficult texts, and how to engage in criticism without losing appreciation. Steve also offers his views on religion, shares his fascination for religious writing, and expresses his passion for the Gospel of Luke and the works of writers such as Erasmus and St. Augustine. So without further ado, Steve Donahue. Steve Donahue, welcome to the podcast. Hello there. <laughs> nice to be here. I'm so delighted to be speaking with you today. As I was telling you in our email exchanges beforehand, I've been a longtime enjoyer of your YouTube channel. Wonderful resource, actually, it is for many, many book recommendations, many discussions on interesting themes. A great deal of bookish content, bookish discussions, bookish recommendations, bookish everything. <laughs> also, you're known for your incredible reading ability, both in volume as well as, as detail and recall. So th these are all things that I'd like to talk a bit about with you. But I wonder if we might start biographically. Could you say something about the context of your upbringing? When were you born? Where were you born? What was your upbringing? Could you say something about, about that context just to orient the whole thing? Well, there, there are several competing scholarly schools on those questions. These have been heated debates since the Reformation. Yes. Was I born in Iowa, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, a small village on the shores of the Black Sea in what is now known as Turkey? Scholars have not settled these questions. <laughs> One thing is known for sure, of course, because I promulgated on my online autobiography, which is that I am, as you see, a raven-haired 28-year-old. <laughs> if you're not that, you have no business being on YouTube. <laughs> but I went to college. There are several schools of philosophy that say I went to graduate level college as well, and then moved out into the world of professional book reviewing for my sins and book editing, book section editing in newspapers. Uh, and then I stopped for a quarter of a century to sell books to the public in a retail bookstore, thinking, I guess, that that would get me closer to the people. <laughs> that would It wouldn't be quite so much the rat race political game of writing for newspapers. Uh, why I couldn't have continued to do both, I have no idea. But I did that for a quarter of a century. I did that for a long time. And then I got back to reviewing. I got back to what I'm doing now, writing book reviews and editing book reviews and also being the editor of a book section of a newspaper. It's kind of full circle, as the English majors say. <laughs> but I am familiar just autobiographically with huge sections of this country. Huge places where I've spent my past in New Hampshire, in Massachusetts, especially in Boston, in Iowa, in Texas, at around Austin. Is that is that vague enough for you? <laughs> well, I'm curious uh, about a little more detail on some specific points. You've mentioned a few times, I've heard you mention a Jesuit education. Yes. You've, you've, you've said that a lot. I'm wondering what you mean. Well, first of all, what is a Jesuit education? What do you mean by that? And what was your exposure to it? Well, it's just, those are listeners. I'm sure your listeners uh, know who the Jesuits are. They are, they are a company, a brotherhood, <laughs> uh, fairly, fairly rigorous intellectual standards. They, uh, that's what they're known for, rather than their zeal of proselytization or sacrifice or poverty or anything like that they're really known for the rhetorical skills uh if you want to convert somebody you won't use a, a jesuit but if you want to out argue somebody you will and i went to school with them where they teach uh well they teach what i have since been advocating in a lay concept which is the use of the brain as a muscle so 
sure, your first year with us, when you're just a mewling little kid, you can have written homework. But after that, it's all memorized. It's all memorized homework. And it's got to be perfect. And sure, you can you can come to us with your, maybe your fond parent hopes that you will get Sunday school indoctrination into religion. But no, we're going to teach text. We're going to teach exegesis. We're going to teach you to, to study these things. I guess you could say that it was the Jesuits who first gave me... Uh, my strongest grounding in my own view of religion as something that is entirely separate from text. The texts are the door that you open. You literally use it to open a door to some living current that is coming through those texts to you. But once you've opened the door, you no longer need the text. And therefore, you are no longer threatened if a Jesuit or anybody else comes along and says, well, this line in that text that you've been reading your whole life is mistranslated. You're not going to burn that person <laughs> for saying that. You're not going to exile them. It's not going to threaten anything because the, the text is, I don't want to say separate from the faith, but definitely it's up for grabs. Definitely it's fair game. That, that, the Jesuits love that. They love the, the intellectual hurly-burly. So I'm assuming this was not university level. This was prior to university level in prior the Catholic. University. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All my all my university and post grad stuff was secular, purely secular. I wonder if we might go one layer deeper still into this Jesuit education thing. Maybe some anecdotes or so. You're talking about the brain is a muscle. You're talking about the importance of memorization. Um, a lot of of this Jesuit education, what is it they say? Give me the boy, I'll give you the man, or something like this. Yeah. So I wonder if you might talk maybe a little bit more precisely or in detail about the philosophy and methods and your own experience of them. Well, the, the, I heard, of course, that famous rubric from the brothers, and they, uh, they were quick behind closed doors, out of the public eye. They were quick to say, uh, we know that that's always characterized as meaning give us the boy and the man will never not be religious. But that's not actually how we think of it. We think, give us the boy, and whatever he does with the religion, he will always view written texts as a playground, or maybe pray, <laughs> in the EY, in the EY says. They will, you will give us the boy, and he will never be intimidated by the text, any text, again. Instead, he will grapple with it. And we will give them the tools to do that. We'll give them the rudimentary tools to do that. You'll be able to build on them your whole life. But the key is to understand that you're not just handed this lump of gray matter. It's a tool like anything else. It's a muscle. If you don't ever work it, well, it will always be in crappy shape. If you do work it, well, the, the sky's the limit to what you can do and to what you can understand. That was wonderful, actually. That was wonderful. I don't mean to cast dispersions on any other on the religious orders, for instance, under the umbrella of Christianity or any other intellectual tradition, but especially the intellectual traditions that are that are wedded to a faith, any kind of faith, far too often they espouse the opposite view, which is that not only your brain, but everything about you is just handed to you, and that it's not only futile to question those limits, but also maybe vaguely heretical. The Jesuits absolutely do not think that. They add, their fundamental approach is that no amount of scrutiny to this or any other text should threaten your faith. That those two things are not, they are not dependent on each other. And so let's go at the text. And in a, in a Jesuit context, maybe alone of all the other societies or brethren or sex or whatnot under the umbrella of christianity in the jesuits maybe alone of all of those you'll be judged praised or mocked on the acuteness of your analysis of the text of the actual words what does the actual original greek say what does what what how do you compare this to someone else's analysis who did it 300 years ago or 1300 years ago and why do you do that wonderful grounding wonderful grounding for uh for a literary life. You mentioned there the original Greek. I understand that you you can read Latin, you can sight read Latin. 
I assume that's where you obtain that grounding. And also, are you hinting at some classical Greek too, uh, some Attic Greek or something of that nature? What sort of language instruction did you have at that period? Well, we 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 had the option of of you know the big three. I was baffled by Hebrew, just baffled by it. I made the barest of inroads, uh, and so I don't have the big three, much less any of the other languages that I really wish I had. I have only a bare barest groping acquaintance with the rudiments of Russian. I know no Chinese, and most most pointedly of all for me, I know no Japanese. But ancient Greek and especially Latin, yeah, we I I, I got along with Latin really well. <laughs> so, so, but, so Greek, of course, like anybody else, it's 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 mind bending. <laughs> it's, it's truly a truly a daunting language. I know linguists will say that all languages are equally daunting to an outsider. I don't think that's true. I I, I don't. I, linguists will often say, well, you know, you're you're speaking from a comforted position. English is baffling to an outsider. I don't know. I don't know about that. Greek, I can handle myself, especially if I've got a good lexicon, you know, at hand. I don't need that with Latin, but with Greek, I still do. And I, those are the Jesuits gave me the rudiments of those. But of course, those are things you have to build your whole life. You can't. No, no original instruction is ever going to be sufficient for that. I, I, I with it's with it's with Roman authors. Uh, that I feel a kind of toe tapping impatience with translators. Uh, I don't feel that with Greek translators. With Greek translators, I'm really interested and I'm willing to learn a lot from them and whatnot. And I often uh, prefer just relaxing <laughs> into an English language translation or something, even if I can read it. I can read Homer, but it's it's not it's very much not the same thing it's very much an alien world and i it, it's nice to have a guide it's with the roman authors behind me here that I, I i savor the english language translations i very much want to know what an english language translator is doing what kinds of decisions they're making i find that endlessly fascinating but when it that's fine when i'm you know critically analyzing a translation especially in preparation for reviewing it but when i just want to relax with catullus or with horace I don't know. Increasingly, as I approach the bitter old age of 29, I, I increasingly just don't want a translator in the room. I just, I will go, I've got some, on the bottom shelves, I've got battered, you know, just good editions in the original languages, or I'll go to the Loeb Classical Library, so, you know, and just hold my hand over the, over the English translation. <laughs> just, just read on one side and not the other. Uh, I I don't know if that answers the question, but that is that is a uh, that's the that was the beginnings of it, definitely was school. Was there anything uh, noteworthy about that education in say Latin and Greek? I'm thinking of C.S. Lewis' account of his learning Greek. Uh, you might know this anecdote better than I do. When he was in the classroom and he was handed a big block of Greek, he had some foundation in it, I presume, and. The professor said, translate that. And the whole class had to translate it. And he came in quite soon afterwards and he barely got through anything. And that was, that was what broke him into Greek, was doing vast amounts of rapid, I suppose, translation. You know, that sort of immersive, high focus, high pressure sort of a situation. Mm -hmm. um, on building presumably on the, uh, uh, of course, on the foundations he would have received earlier. I'm wondering if there's anything remarkable about or noteworthy about the way in which you learned Latin in that Jesuit context? Not noteworthy in that way. I don't know if it's all Jesuits, but the group that I was in scorned tricks. And as a result, even all these centuries later, I myself still scorn tricks. No tricks of any kind. What is the point? And my, my, fortunately for me, I, I'm sure that I, I could have you know, had bad luck with, with the, the random draw of your teachers. But fortunately for me, it was, no, we want you to know this. We want you to know how to do this. We want you to do it right. There aren't going to be any tricks at all. So I never had anything like that. I had an amazing eye-opening moment uh, that one of my teachers was very happy for it. May I remember, I hadn't thought of him as fully human until his reaction where I had some passage of, I don't even know, probably Julius Caesar. And uh, 
he said, well, we can go over this, but I would also, uh, this is a bit of an odd question, but I'd also like to know what your reactions are to this whole assignment. Not, was it hard or was it too long or, or anything like that, but what your reactions are. And I, I blurted out without even thinking, I wasn't ready for the question. I blurted out, boy, this sure makes sense of English. And he was overjoyed just overjoyed by that he said yes yes it does no one reads this no one speaks this and no one writes in this this is exactly why we're teaching you this for that not for not for it itself it's not an end in itself that's exactly why <laughs> it was wonderful and it did it absolutely did although i want to stress it's not necessary english will make sense of itself it's not necessary uh, who are some of your favorite um, we're going to get into these questions, I'm sure, a lot. But who are some of your favorite, um, or have been throughout your life, some of your favorite Roman authors writing in Latin? Horace, Catullus, but for me, most of all, Ovid. Uh, he would even, even in terms of raw tonnage of writing, of reading, of just where the hand goes, I love Horace. Don't get me wrong. He's an old, old friend. But... I had I had a, an old friend actually decades and decades after I went to school of any kind who not knew not one word of any language but English. In fact, there were plenty of people in the newsroom who said he didn't even know English, but he loved Ovid. And uh, I always remember him because there, there's a quip that I love about Ovid, which is that he writes the most wonderful English. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. Not because he's writing in English, but because... He's taking language up by its roots and just revolving it around. Not the story I want to tell, but what is this tool? I'm thinking about this tool, not in a dumb, showy, you know, look ma, I'm writing postmodern way, but in an analytical way. What is this tool that I'm using? I think of it, I think of Johann Sebastian Bach doing the same thing to to music where okay well here's what i've got in front of me and a lesser composer like all of my sons or all of my grandsons would would take these tools and just this is how you move forward you do, we're just going to go lump forward they're never going to lift it up and revolve it around and see what this actually is that kind of playfulness that kind of playfulness with the tools I love Horace and I love Catullus and they are certainly endlessly inventive, but I don't think anybody in the ancient world does that like off. And it makes him just infinitely revisitable. Just just infinitely revisitable. <laughs> I always I always fall down when I'm talking about it. You mentioned memory also being a key aspect of Jesuit training, and that's something that's I think a very interesting subject when it comes to education. Sometimes it's prized as, uh, as in this case, very useful, powerful way of internalizing and making one's own information, uh, becoming one's own encyclopedia or reference or whatever the case is, taking those, that information inside of oneself. Others malign it as pointless, endless repetition and memorization. I think that's the more popular modern view. What's the point of memorizing? Well, for one, we can look it up, but I think even before that idea, there was the sense of, well, it's tedious, it's tiresome, and often associated, associated with Latin. Most people who talk about learning okay. Latin say they found it tedious and it was endless memorization, it was pointless and so on. But I think as a, as a mode of education, it's, it's certainly gone out of fashion. Yeah. So I'm wondering what your experience was of memorization. Can you say something about it, its, its uses, um, and, and how, how has it served you as you've gone on through your life? Well... The reason I think the reason it's maligned is because it's often used poorly. I mean, often, especially in, in well, once upon a time in my youth, in grade schools, in young, in schools for young children, it's often used as a kind of show horse thing. The 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 insufferable little kid with the cowlick and the bow tie is the one who has memorized the whole of Horatio at the Bridge or uh, Paul Revere's Ride or something like that. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't know what it is. It there is a part. There's a, a a function of your brain that is simply imprinting material. They're simply memorizing material. You're not aware of it in any way. You're just memorizing. We knew we use that part of the brain with our phone numbers, 
for instance, or, you know, the latest password on some thing where we memorize it. And that's all there is. That's all there. That's all that you're doing. And I think to give it, a positive spin to things, <laughs> maybe where it isn't deserved. I think that a lot of those pedagogical institutions, half a century ago, might have insisted on that because at some point back in the back of their motivations, they're thinking those muscles must be connected. Those muscles must be useful, and they are. But the whole, po as as I was taught over and over again, the whole point of I don't want to call it rote memorization, but the whole point of familiarizing yourself until you know something is not to be able to recite it. It's to be able to have it at your fingertips. Not when you go to open a book and recite the passage that you've memorized, but rather when you're somewhere else, when you're far away, when you're far, far away. If I'm reading something deep in the bowels on page 500 of a knockoff third string novel of Isaac Asimov, and he writes something that either intentionally or unintentionally echoes something from the book of Ezra. It's not a question of memorization. It's a question of that you know it well enough so that it is at your fingertips, so that you can draw those dots. You can connect those different echoes, whether they're intentional or not. I never view that. I don't know that that's quite just, that is definitely not rote memorization, whatever that is. It's, it's not, I imagine that, Doing lots of rote memorization might bulk up the muscles that would help you as a grounding to do that, but it's the the end the the valuable process is far more nimble than that. And I guess maybe at some point when we're talking about that more nimble process, we might at some points be talking about different neurologies. I am an ardent opponent of any idea that some people are just better than others that some people's brains are more creative than others i hate that attitude completely but it could be that on some areas on some edges of the, the kind of second application of memory that i'm talking about there are just biological differences between individual people i've known plenty of really really intelligent people people who are a lot more intelligent than i am who couldn't manage having things at their fingertips it's just i don't know if that's training or maybe their brain i don't think it's totally forbidden to entertain the possibility that it might be some on the margins difference in brains. I mean, we're not all the same height, right? We don't all have the same eyesight. It's just a part of the body. It, it it's, I guess, stands to reason that it, that some parts of it might be better. Some aspects of cognition might be better in some people than others just inherently, but I think it can be trained to a huge amount. I think it can be trained. It certainly was trained in me uh, because my childhood was not literary at all <laughs> my child was not even human <laughs> so it was as far away from literary as it gets it wasn't block books it was dogs <laughs> you don't even know english for me's sake <laughs> so, so if, if it can if i can manage it anybody can manage it i think i'm pretty sure that those differences exist only at the farthest peripheries yeah sometimes that training is presented as a kind of uh, brute force uh, acclimatization but actually, and this has been true, certainly from the Middle Ages onwards, I'm thinking, um, and well, actually before that, even, even in antiquity, there have been techniques, elaborate techniques of training memorization. Of course, some of those techniques are elaborate because they're sort of the virtuoso level, end stage of a training level architecture of memorization. But nonetheless, they contain in them uh, principles that can be applied, I think, even at the early stages of, of memory training. For example, the association of images with words and syllables, uh, etc., the attempt to uh, synthesize uh, multisensory and imaginary um, um, uh, faculties and even physical faculties uh, using bodily postures and, and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So I'm curious if you were trained in any particular techniques. No, I, I'm very, I've be since become very familiar with those kinds of, you mentioned architecture, they, they're often described literally as memory palaces where you, you construct rooms, you take advantage of the way the human brain thinks about things and associates with things instead of just hoping that will work in your favor, actively take advantage of that and put things in those rooms so that you can go to a room and it will be there as just a memory recall trick. I've, I've since learned lots of those things. And I know people, I've known people that were for whom those things work quite well. 
if I'm doing that, I'm not aware of it <laughs> at all. It's, I don't, certainly that was never anything I imposed on myself, but those are fascinating. I, those are fascinating. There's no doubt those go back at least to the early Renaissance in the West and thousand years before that in the East, uh, where in the East, civil servants had to have a huge amount of information ready at, at their fingertips. And they, we have echoes of their writings that describe that they did things like that. That, that that's how they they housed it. Here's a field. Here's a house. Here are places where I can put information. It won't get in my way, and I won't know it when I'm in some other room. But I'll know what room to go to for it. Sort of a card catalog. I think that's fascinating. I don't think there's any there's any doubt at all that that's not bunkum. That actually does work for some people. I I don't do it myself, but that I that's fascinating to me. Where would you advise somebody to start? Let's say they'd like to improve their memory. They'd like to perhaps commit some passages or poems or maybe scripture, actually, seeing as we'll be talking about that sort of thing a bit later, to memory. Where would you advise a novice to start? I would advise them to start in the 20th century. <laughs> we are, we're in a century where the advice I have to give will not only be completely rejected, but which will have readers under the age of 25 immediately contemplating lawsuits <laughs> because there's only one place to start no matter what you do with it the one place to start is rote memorization because the rote memorization is building the part of the muscle in your brain that actually does the remembering there's no way around that <laughs> there's no way around that even those memory palaces have to be built on something they have to be built on a, on a foundation of rote memorization you have to get those muscles in order and honestly when in human history have those muscles been weaker than now in your ordinary everyday life you do not need to remember anything literally nothing it was the 21st century that i first saw a phenomenon that i'd only ever seen in the 20th century before that in the 20th century i had seen older friends of mine uh, people who were much older than i am wander into a room and have no idea why they had wandered into the room I, I, I had a reason when I came out here. It's no big deal. And of course, worrying about these little lapses of memory is much more harmful than the lapses of memory themselves. So it's no big deal. I made a point of just joking and laughing about it. Uh, but the 21st century is when I first saw that happen to someone who was 20. And then repeatedly to someone who is 20. Not only do they wander into rooms without having any idea why they're there, but they don't wander into rooms without their phone. They don't go anywhere without their phone. <laughs> so I don't think the 21st century has never, there's never been a worse time to, to, for, for a crabby old guy to get on camera and say, the only place you can start with improving your memory is rote memorization. Because <laughs> who, who does that in the 21st century? We don't remember anything anymore in the 21st century. Our phone is for remembering things. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have any other answer. That's the place to start. That muscle has to be in good shape before you do anything with it. And if it's not, you won't be able to do anything. There's no magic to it. There's no hack to, to just memorizing things. Unfortunately, there you go. <laughs> We're lingering on this aspect of your education, but I think the reason for that, the reason why I'm lingering on it, other than that it's very interesting, is that it, I think it does lay a foundation for many of the things, many of the habits of, of reading and, um, and study, if you call it that, that you've carried throughout your life. So in a sense, by treating it at its at its origin. I think it'll contextualize a lot of the things that I want to ask you about later. Um, the power of focus, the power of concentration, call it what you will. This is also something I think that's often attributed to a Jesuit education, uh, that it's a prized faculty. What does focus or concentration and its application in terms of sustained work, what does it mean to you? Well, I want to stress that uh... We have a mild disagreement about etiology here. I, I would have learned, I'm confident that I would have learned, I would be the same person sitting in front of you now if I hadn't had that education. I always worry about going back to education because it gives some listeners the idea that the door's already closed if they don't have that education, when that is absolutely not true. Uh, if I had not learned the rudiments of concentration and focus from school, then I would have learned it in a newsroom. <laughs> in an old style print newsroom when you're in front of a typewriter and your deadline is in 20 minutes <laughs> and if you don't make that deadline you're out of a job you're fired that day no lawyers 
no wrongful termination, no nothing like that. If you don't do that work in that time, and if it's not good enough to print, you're fired. I would have learned focus anyway. <laughs> I would have learned concentration anyway there. And of course, sitting in front of text or a blank page with a pen for a long period of time was natural before the internet. I would have learned I, I would have learned that anyway then too. These things have only come under these these howitzer attacks since the the internet era, since the social media era, when all of a sudden your attention is the greatest commodity in the world. More important than gold, more important than anything. Uh Ironically enough, I'm trying to remember what <laughs> she's so right. <laughs> right. In terms of concentration, it's absolutely essential. And I I talk to people all the time, especially young people, but even increasingly not young people who think they do have concentration. And uh, I just give them a very simple exercise. Can you refrain from looking at your phone for an hour? Not when you're asleep, when you're awake. Can you refrain from looking at your phone for an hour? Can you do that? I know virtually no one who can do that. <laughs> that is staggering. That is a staggering fact. <laughs> and it it's a, an arrow straight to the heart of concentration. Since looking at your phone is by definition breaking your concentration. I, I rejoice when I, of course, through through YouTube, I get to meet a lot of readers and I rejoice when I meet them, the readers that have re that at some point have realized that and taken steps to fix it. And now they view with eager relief the time when they can just say, all right, that's enough of that. Nobody needs me for the next three hours. I am going to sink myself into a book. They love it. This thing that was taken for granted before the internet, they love it and they should. <laughs> it's incredibly healing. I strongly advise it to anyone who's listening. If you can't refrain from looking at your phone for even an hour, and I know plenty of people who can't stop for 15 minutes. If you can't leave your phone alone for an hour, what you need to do is make yourself able to do that. That is not written in stone. That is not a genetic code. Change that fact. That fact is simply bad. <laughs> so change that fact and reach the point where all of your intellectual practices are back to normal, where you can spend hours doing what you want without being distracted. That is all plastic. You can get back to that. <laughs> you should. You absolutely should. Because, <laughs> this is a common refrain when I make my own videos, but in about five minutes, you're going to be dead. <laughs> and thanks to modern medicine, for the year before you're dead, you're going to know it's coming. You're going to, you think you're going to be happy that you didn't grab that, that you didn't change that fact? You think you're going to be happy about that or sad about that? You're going to be sad about that. So don't wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I've shifted into lecturing. <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> you're such a laid back vibe on your channel. I don't, I don't want to shift to Jesuitical finger pointing. <laughs> Well, you know, I think some people, depending on the generation, depending on background and so on, through no fault of their own, have never tasted states of high concentration. Could you say something about what it is like to be highly concentrated, what one gains from it? I think some people might might not be aware of that. Well, you first of all, you make you make a very good point, which is that a lot of the people that I'm referencing here literally don't know what they're missing they've never experienced it so they, they don't know what they're missing uh and that's a real shame <laughs> because it is cleansing it's just to to grapple with something uh, for me it's not peaceful <laughs> for me it's not it's not a pool it's a, definitely a grapple but to, when you, to grapple with something on your own time it, it's you and that thing and it's not anything else Whatever that thing is, it doesn't have to be reading. Whatever that thing is, where it's you and that thing and nothing else, and you are feeling your way along and learning the contours of that thing without being pinged, without being pulled away, without multitasking or thinking of anything else. It's incredibly cleansing. It's the only word, that's the first word that comes to my mind. I, I, in a way that I don't think people who've never experienced it, I don't think they have an equivalent in their life because of the length of it because it takes time to do when you well readers out there will know especially readers who have 
who have prized themselves away from their phones, they will know that absolutely nothing cleans out the system better than just reading for three hours. You don't come out of that confused or in a fog or whatever. You come out of that utterly renewed. Sorry to use, to use self-help language, but it's absolutely true. You come out of that utterly renewed. And I don't think... <laughs> It's like you say, people who've never experienced that have no conception of what they're missing. To them, it's normal to be just dragged, yanked in every direction, all day long, every day. Their idea of a vacation, of a break from that, is to go somewhere else and be dragged in all directions. Go to the Bahamas and be dragged in all directions. That's no, 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 no. And also, not to be gatekeeper or anything, but... You're never going to understand a subject, a, a, a real subject, a meaty subject. You're never going to understand it unless you do that, unless you spend time with it alone, without anybody else in your ear. You're, you're never going to get it to the extent that someone will get it who does do it, who grapples with it on the terms that it was created, <laughs> on terms of that, that the layers that were baked into it. Uh, it's a shame. I, I, I'm in endlessly optimistic that anybody who dislikes that aspect of their own daily intellectual life can change it. I'm endlessly optimistic that you can certainly do that. <laughs> you can certainly change it, even now in the 20th century, in the 21st century, when the whole of the world that you signed up for and that you need, it's not like you actually need it. You need the internet. We all do in one way or another. And that whole world, the whole world that you sign up for, for that thing you need is predatory. And the thing it's preying on is your attention. <laughs> That's the, that is the greatest economy in the world, is your attention. It's amazing the skills and techniques and whole economies that have been built on underhanded and overhanded, understated and overstated ways to shark your attention. But you have control over it. That, that the, 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 one, the dirty little secret of that whole attention economy is that it has a plug. You literally have to plug it into the wall. <laughs> you, you do not need it. You do not need to stay plugged into it. I'm sorry, I'm getting all new agey now. <laughs> did that help at all? Did that did that get us anywhere? I, I think it's an interesting subject. Um, it is. Yeah, it's and um, it's been my observation also that high states of concentration are intrinsically, seem to be intrinsically rewarding. I think sometimes they may be viewed as something arduous. One works up like a marathon um, is sometimes viewed as that. The people that run marathons, they seem to report, and I've never run it myself, <laughs> but they seem to report that despite all this, you know, there's something intrinsically rewarding about about the experience. Um, oh they don't just report rewarding. They report right. transcendent. It's, it's not like they do a marathon and say, all right, that was the peak of misery. <laughs> I was working my way up to the peak of misery, and then I got to the peak of misery. No, <laughs> no, not at all. They say I was working myself through stages of misery, and then I reached paradise. So even weekday runners will report the same thing. It's it's absolutely awful. It, you know, you have to do it at 4 o'clock in the morning because you work all day long. And that first mile is agony. It's just awful. You can think of a million things you'd rather be doing, including staying in bed. But by the end... That the that that you know the chemicals that are released are very rewarding. It's very cleansing. It actually improves the rest of your day. I think what what you're referring to as higher states of consciousness or concentration I, that definitely works. That definitely works the same reaction. And it's been harnessed, of course, by many of the world's religious and mystical traditions for just that sort of access to transcendence. But I think there's something else that distraction robs one of, which is the unstructured boredom time. If on completion of a task, one immediately turns on the podcast, on the music, something like that, then there's something that's that's missed there, which is this unstructured time, the walk to, I live in the UK, so the walk to the kettle, <laughs> you know, with nothing coming in the ears. That, that slight, maybe boredom, that slight moment of mental repose where there's unfocused that's a window of intuition creativity insight of a different type that can come i don't mean a mystical type necessarily i just mean a, a non-linear type it's an important rhythm i think in the operation of a mind of a mind that's 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 working hard and to take that away by people often think of phones as it's the notifications i don't think it's always that 
it's the habitual checking whether there's a notification or not the habitual engaging with yeah. podcast no of course i have a podcast so of course this is the one you can habitually engage great. This is different. <laughs> different and your videos of course uh, when you when you finished engaging with those things nothing else <laughs> but it's that habitual engaging which i think is also what would the mind be doing if it wasn't straight away glomming onto that that uh possibility i think is also an Un, un, uh, uh, underestimated cost of constantly being able to access information. Yes, yes, we're we're drifting towards the borderline of territory where you and I disagree. I think, but I definitely agree. Your brain is a muscle, and you. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna ignore the poor overlooked heart here. The heart, the heart is always saying, "Hey, what about me?" But we're gonna ignore the heart muscle. And we're gonna we're just, we're just gonna use every other muscle and say it's normal. If you, in your normal day life, when you work a muscle, you think, "Well, as important as working this muscle is also resting this muscle." And again, somewhere deep inside, the heart is saying, "What about me? What about chop liver over here?" <laughs> but but nevertheless, every other muscle we think resting is an important thing. And as you point out. Our attention economy is built on never resting your attention. It, you must always be paying it somewhere. Your idle attention is anathema to the, the economy that utterly surrounds us and utterly supports us. Unless you're a yurt farmer in Mongolia, that is true. No matter how disconnected you think you are, you are involved in this. You are part of this. You are dependent on it. There's no use There's no use taking any kind of Robinson Crusoe isolationism idea. It, you're, you're involved in it. I, I get a great kick out of YouTubers who make a good living ostentatiously emptying their minds of all this modern stuff that just runs our lives and then they busily edit and upload. <laughs> I get a great, a great kick out of that. But uh, so, of course, resting that muscle is important periodically, but fetishizing the rest, emptying the mind, yoga -ing, meditating, where I've watched endless videos of people saying what you want is to reach a point where you are empty, where you're thinking of nothing at all. <laughs> I, re I resort to my, uh, my depressing little anthem. In about five minutes, you're going to be dead. And then you can spend the rest of time until the heat death of the universe empty. <laughs> I don't like the, the people who fetishize it, who... who Take it too far and say, well, you know, all this thinking, man. <laughs> so that's what you're here to do. You have one of the most complex brains, organic brains, in the history of life on Earth. So, but but to the limit, <laughs> to, the, to get back to neutral territory, I, we do agree. The resting, the, the walk to the kettle is important. And it's the thing that your phone does not want you to do. And it works. That model, that which is definitely a business model, that's not anything but a business model. That business model is ubiquitous now. I see people going down the street on their motorized scooters looking at their phones. And why? Why would you think someone would do that when it's obvious suicide if you're scootering in, in traffic? Because they've got a little app up in the corner of their phone screen that is scanning the road and will ping them if they're about to kill themselves. It's entirely, <laughs> they're not paying attention. Their app is paying attention. It's uh, it's mind boggling to me when they, uh, this nebulous they, these 21st century people, when they walk to the kettle, they do it with their eyes on their phone. And the only reason they know it's time to go to the kettle is because their phone has told them so. That's disturbing. There's something missing there. There's something lost there. And if if I may be allowed to sound like uh, like Grandpa Simpson for just a minute, it's alarming to think of the world being run by people who grew up that way. But what we live in our world today, we are alive now in the world that we recognize today for one reason and one reason only. And that reason is long-term thinking. And that long-term thinking revolves around the horrors of nuclear war. The only reason that we have this world is because generations of people have realized when they sit down and think about it long term, what a bad decision this would be. And it's horrifying to think that in 30 years, the statesmen of 30 years, 40 years, the statesmen of the world will have grown up without the ability to long term think. 
it's not that they'll that there'll be some of them will be hotheads it's that they won't know how to do it they won't have ever learned how to do it so they will think uh as only a toddler would well we've got these weapons why don't we use them <laughs> it's hard to believe a statesman who would make a comment like that <laughs> well the button's red for a reason <laughs> the same color as my notifications so I might, I might as well use it yeah i that these kinds of doomsday thoughts about the next generation or our kids these days they're always wrong but there really does seem to me to be a fundamental difference i've i have watched well three new installations of kids these days in my life now and this one is different it really is different this these are people who are offshoring their cognitive abilities to a technological device that's made by slaves in China and run by a company in, you know, Germany or whatever it's, and that knows perfectly well what it's doing. They know exactly what they want to do. They only care about eyeballs. That's all. They only care about traffic. Uh, that worries me. That genuinely worries me. I see genuine differences in this group of kids these days. You know, meditation is framed in different ways, in different contexts, by different traditions. And one of the aspects of meditation that's found in many different traditions, it's not the be all and end all of meditation, even in those traditions is attentional training. And so a lot of what you've been talking about here um, is very, very relevant to the concerns of meditation uh, practice. Now, of course, and meditation practice, as you are well aware of, there is the, the, the emptying of the mind sort of approach, the anti-thinking, anti-intellectual approach there are also, of course, means of meditation, techniques of meditation that involve the intellect and use it in memorization, visual, visualization, composition, etc. So it's quite interesting. I think the overlaps in what in what you're saying with the concerns of certain certain presentations of meditation. I'd like to ask you a bit about reading. So I hear you're into that. <laughs> One of my favorite subjects, yes, indeed. <laughs> Oddly enough, it's it's. I recognize the absurdity. It, reading is one of my favorite subjects, even though my single favorite subject is another species that doesn't read and that doesn't miss it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an odd juxtaposition. Maybe that's my meditation. Oh, <laughs> oh he's on my own baton. <laughs> so you have quite an unusual reading schedule. Let's start there. And we can't start there without also including your sleep schedule, which is practically non-existent. So could you, could you yes. yeah, tell us about that? You read a lot. You don't sleep barely. You sleep barely at all. What's going on there? Well, the sleep thing has always been true. It's just a hard thing. I don't sleep as much as your, your listeners do. I, that's just a simple way of it. And that, that is just a hard thing. So that is irrespective of whether or not I'm at the moment sick. It's largely irrespective at the moment of whether or not I'm drunk, how, how stressed I am, anything like that. It's just, it's just a hard, I just require less. It's not, it's not that under optimal conditions I can do with less. It's just that I require less. My whole life has been full of evenings where one after another, the people that I'm with in conversation hit a wall and need to go to sleep. And I just don't. And believe it or not, for communal reasons, for friendship reasons, at that moment, I would kind of sort of like to feel the same thing, but nope. No, there's always going to come a time where I'm just going to gather my dogs, go to some other room and spend the rest of the night reading. <laughs> and that is that is the core of my reading schedule. It always has been. At midnight, I stop everything else, everything in the world, and just read until I sleep, which is a long time. That's going to give me many hours to go. I will sleep, you know, a little bit before dawn. So that's a that's a long time of uninterrupted completely peaceful reading without anything else in in ye olden days i would unplug the phone from the wall and i would unplug the radio and then later than that i would unplug the radio and unplug the tv and unplug the phone and then i unplug the vcr and the little entertainment pile or whatnot and just read and nothing else and now in the 21st century that's become even more pointed because I turn everything off, all, all all the means of the outside world to reach me, I turn off. The only things that have in my life that have ever penetrated into those hours of reading 
have been old or sick dogs where you're out every 20 minutes with them or you're up every hour with them. But other than that, no, just reading. Uh, and I strongly, strong. I mean, not all night long. Obviously, your listeners need their nine hours drooling on a pillow, unconscious. But I, I, I'm not advocating that you that you hurt that because you can do yourself real physical harm to hurt your sleep schedule. Sleep is important. I hate to say it, but it is. Uh, but you should definitely turn off all the notifications on all your electronic devices. You are not important. You do not need notifications. Turn off all sounds. Your machine should never be talking to you. You, it should be your decision to go to them for what you need. They should never be calling you. So turn it all off just blanketly and don't ever think about it. No exceptions, just turn it all off. And I would argue past a certain point at night, eight, seven, depending on when your bedtime is, just turn it all off and concentrate on something that doesn't require your, you know, that doesn't require you to jump in all kinds of directions. Uh, that's That's the core is starting at midnight. And then there's the day. <laughs> there's the, I'm a, I am a, a professional book reviewer. I'm a, I'm a writer, so I don't have an office to go to. I don't have a set schedule during the day at all. I, so if I'm going about my day, I mean, the, the number one focus during the day is my little dog. Right now, I only have one dog. If she wants anything, including a long walk out in the countryside, well, then she gets that, you know, because I deprive her of the one thing I deprive her of is her ability to come and go as she pleases. So the only thing that makes that morally palatable at all is if the minute she has the slightest inclination to go outside, we go. Never a no from me. Never a wait from me. Uh, but aside from that, during the day, of course, I have floating writing things that I have to do every day. I have floating writing things that need to get done. But there's a lot of reading that happens during the day as well. A lot of it. Like... Uh, uh, what's a, oh, a recent example? Uh, there was a, I got a periodical in the mail. It had uh, an excerpt, an adapted excerpt from Marilyn Robinson's new book on the book of Genesis. And I was reading the magazine, just minding my own business. And when I read when I finished that article, that sent me to reread her book from start to finish, which also sent me to reread Genesis from start to finish. And that kind of reading happens throughout the day. That kind of, you know, scare up a hair reading happens throughout the day. And that can sometimes be long. Sometimes one of those little reminders or a thought in my mind will sink me into a book and I will stay in that book for hours until I'm finished with it. So there's a lot of reading that happens during the day, but I'd say the bulk of the intense uninterrupted reading happens at night. People are gonna to wanna to know, when you say you don't sleep much, what are we talking about in terms of hours? 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Wow. two hours something like that there's there's as far as uh the sleep lab the sleep lab at mass general as far as they're concerned there aren't many people who are like that usually when you get someone who has whittled down their hours even as low as five they're doing serious neurological damage to yourself i think it's the thing that not a lot of people everybody all the humans that i know love their sleeping <laughs> but but none of them know how important it is it's it's absolutely vital it's as vital as food if you muck around with it at all you're going to start to do serious damage to your health the the productivity bros who've managed to whittle themselves down to five hours with 50 cups of coffee and energy drinks all day and getting up at four and you know rise and grind they're really hurting their bodies really hurting their bodies even on the margins that's true even on the margins your phone very much does not want you to sleep uh, so you will you're probably hurting your sleep schedule and shaving off time at the beginning and the end of your sleep schedule with that anyway and that is telling on you that that is telling on your physical health not even talking about your well-being we're talking just about your heart uh but i'm not like that <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not actually doing that this is just this, like i said this is just a hard wall it's it's just there it's not not it's not a product of effort at all and it's it's very little it's 90 minutes, two hours, and it can be postponed. <laughs> Those 90, that 90 minutes or two hours can be postponed. If, if, if I get to 4.30 in the morning and I'm rip snorting in the middle of a terrific book or even an infuriating book, there's not a chance in the world that I'm going to say, well, I'll have to get to this tomorrow. There's not a chance in the world that I'm going to do that. <laughs> All that's going to result if I skip that 90 minutes is that I'm going to be a little bit tired the next night at 4 30 in the morning that's all that's the only penalty that i'm going to pay so i often do that <laughs> i often just skip but that part 
it often feels unproductive to talk about it because it's not, not learnable. It's it's not plastic. There are certain just walls in your physiology. You're only so tall. Your your body only only reacts in such a way to process sugar. Is it a good way? Is it a neutral way? Is it a bad way? You can't change that. So I th this doesn't strike me as the kind of infinite plastic self improvement stuff that we were talking about elsewhere. This is not the same thing. I'm curious what comes to your mind if I was to ask you what are your reading habits, in other words, how you approach reading that others perhaps differ in, but also things like, uh, well, sub vocalizing, I know is a, is an issue you bring up a lot, annotation and so on, and remembering what you read, maybe that's a whole category of things. And, uh, and a lot of people find this hard to believe. And I also find it hard to describe. It's one of the rare things about my reading experience that I find hard to describe. And that is the feeling that I have when I start a new book, any new book, of any kind, no matter what it is, an older title that I've somehow missed, or I, I, of course, get a huge traffic in new titles. I don't think I've ever been able to accurately describe what I feel like at that moment. I think a lot of people who've known what I do for a living assume that it must be a bored sigh. And it's the absolute opposite of that. It is a kind of blinding joy that comes with encountering an entire palette of new possibilities, even if it's an author that I know very well. I start a new book, it's a pure, blinding, joyous experiment. And then the book fails me. <laughs> then, the book, then the book lets me down. Almost immediately, they start letting me down. Oh, that's the word you want to use? Oh, but you did the same intellectual trick in your last book and the book before that, or et cetera, et cetera. But that first moment, whoa, <laughs> that is just awesome. That is just amazing. And then I do go through the book. And I, I read critically, uh, which means that I'm paying attention the whole, I'm not being swept away. I'm paying attention the whole time to the choices that the author is making and also the choices that the editor is making and also the choices that the publishing house is making. And beyond at the back of them, the choices that are being imposed on them may be unconsciously by the zeitgeist, by the moment in time. Why are all these, author, these male authors in the mid 20th century writing about sex and their members? Why are they doing that? They might not even be aware of the whole of that. But if you're reading critically, you're looking at all of those levels all the time. You're just that there's that blinding moment of joy of infinite possibility. And then I get down to cases, pencil in hand, grappling with the work. OK, what is going on here? How is this being done? And I love it. Absolutely love it. I've had so many people over the years say, look at me with horror and say, oh, it sounds like you're sucking the joy out of reading. And I understand that. They very much read in a subjective sense. I always, I always jokingly describe it as reading with their lymph nodes. They're, they're very much, they're the type of people who will cry when they're reading a book. They're the type of people who will not just figuratively, but literally throw a book across the room. They're the type of people who will identify with the characters rather than identify the characters. They'll identify with the characters, feel like they know them. I'm on team so and so. I'm on team such and such. I sometimes mistakenly dismiss that as an adolescent way to read it isn't i've known plenty of readers who do that their whole lives and get have wonderful reading lives out of it it's just that's a non-critical way to read where you're opening yourself you have that same moment of blinding joy at the beginning of the book but it's just staying that way <laughs> it's, you're, you're not grappling you're not getting down to cases after that you're just saying all right go ahead tell me stories that is an ancient primordial human way to approach any kind of well, I want to say fictive world, but it also applies to nonfiction as well. That That's old, maybe older than critical reading, and is totally acceptable. It's totally honorable. It's just not what I do. I, people often ask me, okay, you read critically when you're reading for work, but surely you don't read that way all the time. No, <laughs> I read that way all the time. The only thing that stops that from happening is if I know the book so well, if I've read it so many times, that there's no point in reading it critically anymore that and that usually that that's only old old favorites that's not that's not most of the books that i read are new releases in the american book market and that that doesn't apply to them and sub vocalizing yes yes i get a, i get a lot of questions about this because people people listen to me talk about books and they, they say well you know the thing that haunts me the thing that bothers me the most is all the books out there that i'm not reading because i'm a slow reader or because I don't have much time to read or whatnot. 
and they always <laughs> very good naturedly they're not being weedly about it but they always want some sort of magic bullet is there there's got to be some magic here how do you do it and uh, <laughs> there isn't but the thing that comes closest is sub vocalization people will most readers are taught to read uh the words out loud before they can actually read them on the page most readers are taught that in school they're taught to write to read out loud to know their letters forever and ever in america anyway the term to know your letters meant to know them out loud to be able to say them out loud but you don't have to do that your the part of your brain that reads text on the page is different from the part of your brain that reads it out loud and they don't have to be connected to each other at all this is actually true the, the process of reading out in your mind at the speed you would read it aloud, all the things that you read with your eyes is subvocalization. And you don't need to do it. And you can you can prove to yourself that you don't need to do it because there are times in your life when you don't. Even if you've been thoroughly taught to subvocalize. If you're, if you're 18, you're out in Peoria and you're eagerly waiting the fat envelope, not the thin envelope from one school that you sent to, the thin envelope is going to say, we don't want you. The fat envelope is going to say you're accepted and here are the terms under which you're accepted and here are all the things we're going to do for you. If you're that 18 year old and you've been self vocalizing your whole life and you don't even know you're doing it or you, you told yourself you can't stop when you get that fat envelope and you open it, you're not going to self vocalize. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to absorb it. You're going to skip the self vocalizing and just, it's going to go straight to your, to your brain. It's going to go straight from your eyes to your brain. Same thing with uh, street instruction signs. You don't subvocalize those. You you just read them, and and I, the point I like to make to people is that you can do that with all your reading, and that will increase your speed, double or even triple it. Once you stop hobbling yourself to the level of the speed with which you can read something out loud, I mean, just try it. Try reading something out loud. It takes a long time. Uh, once you stop coupling those two things, your reading speed will go up. I always I always make sure to emphasize. That that's not a better way to read. That's just if you want to read more, that's a way for you to read more. Reading more is not the goal, and reading without self-vocalizing is not better than reading with it at all. I'm not, this is not me saying, oh, you poor things. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, plenty of people, uh, after all, not only do people learn to read verbally, out loud, but most readers fell in love with reading by ha by being read too long before they could read that's a wonderful feeling i would imagine it didn't happen with me but it's a wonderful feeling there's nothing wrong at all with preserving that and sub vocalizing is an odd way of preserving that you are reading to yourself so i want to make sure that i'm that we're clear here i'm not talking about anything qualitative here i only ever bring it up when people ask me how can i read more that is a way you can read more prioritize reading don't expect that it will just happen. <laughs> you have to prioritize it like you would anything else. No, You're not expecting to get better at ballet by never practicing ballet. <laughs> you don't expect that. You don't expect that in any else in the world. So prioritize reading and also stop and stop vocalizing. If you do those two things, your reading will go up. No matter how little time you have for it, the amount of reading that you do will go up. Um, I just wanted to be clear. I'm not talking about a better and a worse way of reading. Just, I get accused of that. I, don't, I want to make sure we're clear on that subject. Do you have time now to pivot to religion for 15, 20 minutes or so? I have writing duties today, but I'm all yours. <laughs> I'm all yours to talk about religion. Religion is wonderful to talk about. <laughs> I'd like to, how are we going to approach this? Let's see. I'd like. It's, it's tricky. I'm, sure. I've been amazed and gratified in the last five years how many people have found out that despite what it sounds like, I actually love to talk about religion with them and they will love to talk about it with me. That has been an amazingly positive experience, not echoed in the pre-internet era of my life with the people I met. But it is tricky. You, how do you want to approach this? <laughs> well, I certainly don't want you to pull any punches or uh, worry about or or uh, take into account any offense that you might cause me or anybody else in your mind. I we, we discussed that actually by email before. You were very kind to sort of forewarn me um that you have some opinions that basically uh, i asked him are you sure you want to talk to me <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and so well, I, 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 <laughs> yeah so please don't pull your punches on it i think it would be interesting to to for you to say something about your view of religion in particular what is your sort of take on religion your view on it and uh 
what, what's your history with it? Did you ever have a dalliance? Did you ever have a moment of, of, of faith? No. No, because my earliest associations, my earliest friends and companions weren't human. And only humans do this. So I, 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 real, I, I was aware right away of how artificial this is. Because you have to go inside and put on human clothes to even know this exists. Whereas my childhood playmates, they knew about bad moods. They knew about good moods. They knew about being hungry. They knew about how good it felt to eat. They knew about how bad it felt to overeat. They knew about the sun and the wind and the grass. They knew about power structures and dominance and submission. They knew about humor and prank humor and bad humor. They knew a whole bunch of things, a whole spectrum of things. But this was just not there at all. Just not there at all. This whole concept of there being some sort of other world. No, <laughs> it was just, no, that was not there at all. I had to go into human society to even see that. So I was aware right at the beginning that it is artificial that it's it's not real it's not part of the world and uh that creates the the odd tricky dichotomy here <laughs> when it comes to the subject of religion for me when dealing with religious people because I, the the best people in my life the strongest people personally the strongest people morally the most giving people that I have known in my life, almost without exception, have been religious people, devotedly religious people, not any one denomination, not any one faith structure, just that. And so, of course, I'm not, I'm not denigrating that reality, the reality that those people are offshoring or drawing from offshore some source of energy that they have convinced themselves allows them to be better than they would be without it. I'm not denigrating that 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 phenomenon is real. Of course, it can be abused. There are all sorts of hucksters out there, all sorts of liars out there. But that phenomenon, when it's real, is incredible. That phenomenon, when it's real, sends people into plague zones and has for centuries. It sends them into the rubble of earthquake-stricken cities where aftershocks could kill them. It sends them into places where they know they're going to die on the hope that they can do some good. Those people tell themselves, are completely convinced that it's their religious faith that gives them the personal moral bandwidth to summon that kind of courage. And I respect that. That phenomenon is real, and I love it, and I love examining it. But it's wrong. <laughs> it's, it's wrong, because that other place where they're drawing that energy from is not real. There are no gods. There is no supernatural element to existence. If you're going to say, well, that's just your opinion, man, or if you're going to say, well, no, I think there is, prove it to me, show it to me. You cannot claim something is real if you can't show me it's real. And you can't. And no, I'm not you, my, my esteemed host, but you in the general sense, no one has ever been able to do that and no one ever can because they don't exist. These things don't exist. That world, all these beings, they don't exist, which of course lends a nefarious aspect to all their precepts because they're not their precepts. They don't exist. They don't have any precepts. These are the precepts of men who are using the interstice between that, that offshore world and this world to do all sorts of horrible things for themselves. It's impossible to extricate religion from the structures of religion. And it's impossible to extricate the structures of religion from the abuses of those structures. It's hard not to wander right away into negatives. The point, the reason, the reason I started with the positives is because they are foremost in my mind, apart from structures, apart from Kenneth Copeland, apart from grifting of any kind, apart from any of that. Religious people, genuinely religious people, believe that they are actually connected to something that makes them better, something that is a backstop for their own personal courage. They're sure that their own personal courage would fail them in situation X, Y, or Z if it weren't for that. And they're grateful for that. And because of that, their courage doesn't fail. Them. That is incredible. That is, to use a loaded word, a miracle. I think it's fraudulent. I think that it's that strength is in you. It has to be in you because it's not anywhere else. <laughs> there isn't anywhere else. Nevertheless, if they think that, if they believe that, I respect that. 
and, and I imagine now that I've thoroughly muddled the subject, <laughs> I'm not. I, what I'm trying to say is this is bunkum and it does wonders. <laughs> and, and that's not an easy thing to say. <laughs> there is no transcendent dimension to reality. There is no knowledge with a capital K. There are no ancients with a capital A. They're picking lice out of their hair. And there's most especially no wisdom with a capital W. None of it. None of that is real. There is no supernatural element to existence. Religious people are certain that there are. They know what they know, what they know, what they know. They're certain that it is. And the, the good ones, which I think are the vast majority, do wonders with that knowledge. It reminds them to be better. It reminds them to be more generous. It reminds them to be selfless. God help us. In the 21st century, anything that reminds people to be selfless, <laughs> get a thumbs up from me. That it, it reminds them to do all those things. It keeps them grounded. It keeps them humble, the real religious people. It keeps them humble, and it makes them generous. All of those things are not just human traits, but primate traits. They are all hard. I believe they are all hardwired in. But if, if there are a great number of people who either don't believe or have been conditioned not to believe that those things are within their grasp. And so if that's what they need to access those things, I am not. I am on the one hand saying, OK, this thing that you need to access all of those things in yourself, it's not real. <laughs> None of it is real. But on the other hand, the things that you're doing as a result of it are. I don't think that clarification clarified anything. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> so I'd like to return to some of those those themes. Thank you very much. The what about the should we say to return to the theme of reading, and then I would like to come back to some of the things you mentioned there. Think of religion in terms of published material. There's scripture and Perhaps we could include uh, myth, uh, story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's a quite a broad basket. There's there's also um, philosophy, theology, and so on. And there's and there's also history of religion, or yes. uh, comparative religion, and, and and that sort of thing. So there's there's a range of things written about uh, about and um, as religion. How do you relate to that whole? set of written material to do with religion most of it is fascinating i'm sure you agree most of it is utterly fascinating oh my oh my i think i'm a little biased because most of it ends up in its bare bones being uh critiquing criticism a great deal of religious writing in the world now and also in the last three thousand years is people grappling with texts and that's what I do for a living. <laughs> it's it's a thrilling to see, absolutely thrilling to see. I honestly don't know. This is going to sound really, really dorky, but I I honestly don't know of a more thrilling book to read than the Talmud or the Sonsino Kumash, where you've just got these huge brains who've been grappling with these texts forever. They're they're piling a whole bunch of meaning into one adjectival phrase. Wonderful. That is just thrilling to see. I, the only difference between me and the people who take those things in, you know, in shul is that I don't think they're real. They're not. They're not about anything real, <laughs> and, until you get to the point where they're about a text, and then they are about something real. It's just what I'm saying is all the way at the back of it. There's no there there. That's all. That's the only thing that separates me from those kinds of scholars, is that they think there is, and I know there isn't. If there is, you should be able to show it to me, and you can't. Uh, but otherwise, the literary criticism, the literary expenditure, exegesis, the thrill of wonderful exegesis, oh my God, it's just fantastic, just utterly fantastic. Of course, I part ways with most formal philosophy, <laughs> uh, because most formal philosophy is that theology, and if it had the balls to admit that, I'd be fine with it, but it doesn't. Instead, it, it's still positing. If you're positing and theorizing about and anatomizing and going on an interminable length, about anything supernatural, and by supernatural I mean something you can't show me, then what you're doing is religion. And one of my main beefs with most formal philosophy is that that's what it's doing, but it's not admitting that. And of course, 
a large part of it, a large part of the reason why it's not admitting it is because it doesn't want to admit the foremost allure of most religious superstructures, which is that you get the power of a priesthood. To, to me, the, of course, you are, if you watch my channel, you already know. To me, there's there's very little good to be said about someone who considers themselves a philosopher because they're a priest and they don't even have the guts to admit it. <laughs> they're still an emissary for an unseen world. If you're an emissary interpreting an unseen world to me for money, you're a priest. I, that Even that feels a little wrong to say because I've known a huge number of great priests in my life. <laughs> so I don't mean it as a term of condemnation. Uh, but we don't have the time for me to rant about philosophy <laughs> like we do. <laughs> so it seems you're able to appreciate religion, religious writing, uh, at, at least at the level of textual criticism and literary criticism. You're able to appreciate it at, at least on that level, perhaps not exclusively on that level, whilst at the same time be engage with it very critically. Now, you mentioned that before in terms of your Jesuit education. They weren't afraid of of what they might find if they if they, oh. if they engaged, if they took the Bible, say, as, as seriously as one imagines someone would if one really thought it was the word of God, you know, really get, get into it. Right. Um, even if that investigation unravels any any ability to treat it as such. If your faith, I'm not talking about your church. If your faith comes from written words, then it's the written words you worship. And I don't know of any truly religious people who worship written words. So it should not matter to you, for instance, the famous example. Uh, it should not matter to you that the actual translation of the word is not the Virgin Mary, but young girl Mary. That should not matter to you. Or think of all the people who were burned to death in England for the crime of wanting to print the Bible in English. If that threatens you, then what you're what you're threatened what's threatened there is a church, not a faith. Because those are just you're right. It's just text. You're just grappling with the text, and I love doing that, and I love talking about doing. It. I love reading people doing that. The only main difference for me is that I'm saying that the text is about something that isn't real. The text is still real. I wonder if we might talk a bit more about this idea of criticism, or of textual criticism, or of critical reading, and and. Some people, I think, associate critique with deconstruction, with destruction, maybe even with denigration. If I can critique something, I've rendered it lesser or lower. I've, I've rendered myself superior to it. I no longer need it. There's nothing there for me if I can poke a hole in it somehow or another. And that can be very scholarly or it can be, uh, you know, le le less, less or so. So what's this relationship between critique and appreciation? Well, that kind of hole poking is often done. It gives the whole idea of critical analysis of anything a bad name. But we actually know we have the recipe in his own handwriting for the paint and the grinding and the mixing that Michelangelo used for the Sistine Chapel ceiling. We actually know all of that. We, we know exactly how he managed perspective from the floor perspective from one end or the other end of the church. We know the mechanics of all of that, that you're taken right out of yourself when you look at it. It's, it's the same thing, really, as what I was talking about, about religion. You can analyze how a work is put together and how it does what it does and still be completely moved by it, just completely moved by it. If you lose that ability, if you, if you lose that ability and just sink into endless, reflexive, mindless nitpicking, well, <laughs> well, then once upon a time, you would have had a lock solid job at the New York Times. <laughs> and, and that isn't real criticism. Real criticism that shuts its ears to wonder is useless to its readers. A, a perfect example, the example that I used to use to illustrate this point a long, long time ago, decades and decades and decades, decades ago, when I would make this point to people, I would always say, I would always point to the Glenn Gould Goldberg variations, uh, where you can hear him on the recording, humming and tapping the side of the piano and making little thumping noises when he's getting, the, the, the sound editors very intentionally left those things in. So you are aware, you are being reminded at every turn of that original recording that a human being did this at a particular time, in a particular place, in a particular mood. 
the whole time that you're listening to it, you're you're being reminded that, that of all the critical underpinnings of it, it will still lift you out of yourself completely. It's still utterly incredible, transcendent, to use to use a word in one context where we'd agree with it. It's still it's still transcendent. So I don't believe that the one is ant antithetical to the other at all. Not at all. I think it's actually kind of a backhanded insult to a creator of any kind, a composer or a painter or an artist to say, I don't want to examine how you did this. I mean, is is to get back to the, 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 you know, the most inhuman of all the classical composers, Johann Sebastian Bach, if, if you'd have asked him, do you think he'd have said anything other than I used the tools I had? No, of course he wouldn't. It's, I think it's a kind of a backhanded insult. It, it implies that you need the mystery for it to be wonderful. When no, <laughs> no, it's, it's the, it's the exercise of brilliance. It's your skill that makes it uplifting, that produces that transcendent response. Your skill comes from your tools, comes from your use of your tools. I guess, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that I am closing the door at every possible juncture to anything supernatural. There is not anything supernatural in the world. The world is plenty marvelous on its own. It does not need the supernatural. And most creative people that I've known, when they're down in the trenches, when they're working on one particular dangling participle to get this chapter perfect, so that it will move people, they would kick you out of the room if you said that at that moment they're recoursing to a gods. They'd kick you out of the room. It's not the gods aren't here. I'm the one sweating blood onto this page. It, it, I think that that is that that is the case. That is, it's just that unfortunately, uh, bad critics give the whole concept of criticism, not just literary criticism, any kind of criticism. Bad critics give it a bad name by doing what you described, by harping and nitpicking, poking holes. It's not what I do. I hope that's not how people perceive what I do. Right, I think it's notably what, not what you do, actually. I'd like to think that even my worst enemies would say that the one quality of my criticism, verbal, on camera, in writing, in writing is enthusiasm. Not a joyless kind of pedantic nitpicking, but enthusiasm. Even if my enthusiasm is hatred, <laughs> it's still it's still not. I'd like to think that. So you've pointed, I think, to two. Maybe we could say mistakes, for, for want of a better word. One is to be afraid to analyze and critique. Oh, I don't want to look into the details of the Bible, for example, or the Upanishads or what the Buddha really said. Do we even know that, et cetera, et cetera, because it's going to ruin you see the, that reflected the assumptions. In in America, yeah, well, there are whole kinds of churches in in America that are uh, that call themselves proudly call themselves King James only. Sure, they don't want to know what any other translations say, and most importantly, they don't want to know what the original says either. They just want the King James. That is a way of saying no. Right, and we don't even know what the original <laughs> says. When you get into the level of philology, philology it becomes another matter entirely. In in some cases, you know, in some in some instances. So there's that reluctance to investigate, reluctance to examine, and then there's this other, other mistake, if we could call it that, which is this misunderstanding of what criticism is, or taking criticism as somehow a denigration of that which one critiques. If you can see through it, you've mastered it, you've, you've uh, rendered it um, obsolete or so something like that. I had an old critic friend who was just this kind of a critic. God, I dreaded every time he got a commission. I just dreaded it. I just I knew what I was going to get. And he and I used to talk every Friday uh, in, in person over wine. We would just we would talk about the craft. And I finally got fed up with it. <laughs> I finally got fed up with it one day where he was, I believe the exact book that we were talking about was Hawaii by James Mishner. Uh, and he was doing exactly what you're describing he was just giving me the whole laid out da vinci code of how he gets this these effects in his books and i finally just stopped him and said all right okay you've laid out exactly how he does it now do it yourself he's a multimillionaire. are you <laughs> it seems to me i had to pay for your supper so you know if, if, if laying out the, the whole of the schematics of how it's done were the be all and end all of criticism you'd be a multimillionaire, and you're not so <laughs> so maybe there's an element here that is involved other than that like appreciation, maybe. <sighs> well, I'm I'm curious how one saves criticism from just 
being that. I think s some people think to engage critically is necessarily to uh, traipse, traipse over, over a text. I think there's an assumption that that, that, that that comes together. And so I think maybe there's a traipsing over a text that can be, um, be unintentionally included because people think that's what criticism is. One has to have that view. I'm thinking I... Uh, it brings to mind a, 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 some, something of a meme, which is Christian, let's say naive Christian, uh, goes to, loves Christianity, okay, goes to university and studies, let's say, divinity, theology, whatever the case may be, a secular institution, Bible college, whatever it might be. And in so doing, in that first year, are confronted with uh, a way of looking at their religion and their texts that, well, they, to put it briefly, lose their faith. They realize the Bible isn't what they thought it was, just to use the Christian example. I mean, it could apply, I think, to any, really could apply to any, it certainly could apply to Buddhism, certainly could apply to Islam. And in looking more deeply, they realize, gosh, this isn't what I thought it was. My assumptions about, about this religion and about this text and about, have been challenged. And so they lose their faith. And maybe even become disillusioned with the entire uh, the, the entire enterprise. So what's what's going on there? What would you say to somebody like that? Not necessarily to help them retain their faith, but perhaps to help them from that crisis experience develop this ability to be critical, not lose that faculty, maybe even sharpen it, but at the same time salvage something of appreciation. From that, what can be what can be salvaged from the rubbles of one's lost fundamentalism, uh, with with when when this sort of critical view comes into play? Well, some of the initial things that I would say to that person aren't helpful, and I know that, so I tend not to say them. The natural first thing I want to say is, well, this was pretty weak foundations if it can be knocked apart by some boring professor. Uh, the I, the main uh, your the goal here of your question to get people to reclaim something good from that experience is very important because the usual response of people who grew up fundamentalist religion let's say again christianity uh and encounter a challenge like that the usual response is for them to flee from the thing that did the challenging not from their faith so they retreat into a kind of mindless baby Christianity. I believe this because I believe it. I know because I know because I know the Bible tells me so. And those people end up either living in curious lives, which is really a waste. <laughs> that is really a waste. You have you have billions and billions of years coming up where you can live in incurious life. Mm -hmm. Or it makes them dangerous. Or, or they retreat into the world and think that anything that challenges anything that they believe is negative because I had that happen to me when I was a freshman in college. And if you, if those kind of people, they retreat into that kind of uh, cant and nonsense, they don't stay in a place of comfort. They bounce back into attacking the world that criticized their faith. And that can be dangerous, really, really dangerous. If they end up, for instance, I don't know, Speaker of the House of Representatives, <laughs> a position of real power, that can be really, really dangerous. Because then they're going to view anything in that world as the outside world as hostile and go on the attack against it. The the response the the is helpful I hope helpful response that I want to give to those people is well your own faith tradition tells you about the still small voice. Did anything speak to you that wasn't part of a book or a text? If it did, well then it should still. And if it didn't then it wasn't there. You might still be able to find it, but if it isn't there and you're an adult, do you really want to go looking for it? If it isn't there, well, think of all the other things you could do, right? It's not required, obviously, because you've never had it and now you don't have it and know you don't have it and your life is still the same. So do you want to go looking for it? Either in you know the Vatican or at the top of the Himalayas or wherever, do you want to go looking for that? Or maybe just maybe you just don't have it. Maybe that's just not there. Whereas a lot of the truly religious people that I know, that is there. They go to a secular college, maybe because it was the most affordable one, not because they were looking to challenge their faith. They get their faith challenged to the limited extent that that Darwinian evolution or the geologic column is actually a, a challenge to faith. It seems pretty ridiculous to me that it would be. But 
if you see those things and they feel like a challenge and that still small voice is still there what you encounter when you pray is still there every bit is strong so you're learning about all these things and that is still there every bit is strong well then that was real then that was a part of you i don't know no, this isn't very helpful <laughs> this is very helpful to people who want that to be there if it's not i think it's a lot more helpful to just acknowledge if that voice is not there if that call that connection that you feel you have to some other world if if you feel that connection after it's been threatened then that feeling on your part is probably real the world is not real that other world is not real but the feeling might be real if you don't if if it's challenged and that whole thing just falls apart well then you know maybe you're better off without it you're certainly better off without it than faking it and becoming a fraud becoming a charlatan i believe kenneth copeland's name has already come up in this conversation <laughs> you're certainly better off not faking it what can be salvaged of the critical engagement with the text if it's not a critical engagement if it's not an engagement to more deeply uh, understand what the word of god says for example or what the enlightened buddha said if that framing becomes impossible not because necessarily if they've been challenged by in their biology class but let's say the, uh, um, they're, they're studying the text itself in detail because they're passionate about finding out what God said or what the Buddha said and what the truth is because that's, of course, Buddha knew, knew the truth. God knows the truth. And that framing becomes difficult to continue with. What can be salvaged of a critical engagement in those texts if, if, if that framing is no longer operable? Oh, the thrill. The thrill is still going to be there. It's still unbelievably thrilling. It's still unbelievably thrilling, the whole process of doing that. What does this text say? What doesn't it say? What did so-and-so say about what it says and doesn't say 300 years ago? And is he right? And what about the, the so-and-so that responded to him? And what about this great opera that was built out of this? When this opera composer or the, his librettist, when they were making this thing, what did they include? What did they leave out? How did they change it? Oh, the thrill is still there. Absolutely. And that thrill is also the way you thread your way through bad criticism, the nitpicking kind, and good criticism, the, the, the real kind. That's the way you do it, because there's no way to impose an institutional correction on bad criticism. There's no way to do it. The institutional correction would be an editor at the front lines, and that editor is only concerned with filling this space. <laughs> he's not. He's only very secondarily concerned with whether or not it's the good kind of criticism or the bad kind of criticism. No, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You, the, the thing to do is when you encounter a piece of critical reaction to anything, does it thrill you? Is it doing the right kind, or is it just sourly nitpicking? Once you know that it's thrilling, follow it. Follow that thread. That writer had to learn that from someone else. Had to learn how to do it that way from someone else. Not necessarily part of a formal school, but if you follow that thread and just leave the others behind, you'll find others. You'll find other stuff like that. And oh my God, religious commentary, any denomination, any faith is full of that kind of commentary. It's just amazing. Thank you. Very interesting indeed. Well, this has been a fascinating couple of hours. Thank you so much. I wonder if we might end with, what are some of your favorite books to do with religion? And they might be very, very specific to a particular uh, theme or topic, or they might be very, very broad, almost encyclopedic and so on. What are your favorite books? They might be scriptural, they might be commentarial, they might be historical or comparative. When we talk about my favorites, that's what we'll be talking about. We won't be talking about the things necessarily that I esteem the highest, or even that I think are the most complex. And of course, when it when it, you get when you when you truck in that kind of subjective element, you go with. I mean, I might never have believed any of this stuff, but I was raised in a Christian world, so of course it's going to be Christianity. Of course it is, uh, and for me, that is just an endless source of enjoyment. But some some things do stick out. The Gospel according to Saint Luke, Luke and Acts, are stand to me stand out far above any of the other Gospels, far about uh, any other parts of, of you know, the New Testament. Uh, and also uh, St. Augustine, who for all his faults, I love. I love spending time with him on the page. I'm one of the only people I know who prefers the city of God to the confessions. I just love it. And all the other stuff that, of his that is so wonky that it only gets academic English language translations. But 
I, I love it. I love that sort of thing. I love him. And uh, most of all, we'd, we'd have to shoot forward several centuries. Most of all, Erasmus, who spent most of his life, I mean, he was in Holy Orders, so he spent most of his life writing about religion, about Christianity in one way or another. He wrote other things too, but I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of St. Anselm and, and Augustine and Jerome, who is not known now at all. There are no popular editions. Penguin, Oxford, they don't do a popular edition of any kind of Jerome selection. But Erasmus, something about Erasmus, something about his way of looking at the world, something about the fact that, that he would have been right at home, for instance, in this conversation, when a whole bunch of theological expositors on either side of him at his in his own day would not have been comfortable in this conversation at all. He would have known exactly what we're talking about. And I think he would have agreed with the thrill of it all, even though he lived at a time when people were burned alive for questioning the written word, for questioning the text. Even if there's a little thing as that, they were murdered hard before. He was alive and knew that, but I, I think that was, it, he he speaks to me a lot. He's much later in the, in the tradition, but those are some of the ones that stick out for me. I, I don't think much of that is communicable uh, in terms of recommending <laughs> a, a normal per, a, a general reader a general interest reader would probably find saint augustine's confessions very interesting and maybe they would be able to pick up on some of the humor in erasmus's praise of folly maybe they would be able to it's it's deeply enmeshed in liturgical questions of the day that don't so much apply today but i think you could still get in a good translation, I think you could still get a very lively humor and intellect behind it, and that might that might carry you along. I think most people answering this question would go to somebody like C.S. Lewis. I, my own, my own favorites are are earlier than him. I'm curious why Luke and Acts, and what about Augustine? You said you, you like him so much. You you kept saying that I like him. I like. What do you like about him? Uh, you've said something about Erasmus. Maybe there's more to say. What about Luke and Acts and Augustine? Well, Luke. The, the the Luke author strikes me that he is telling a story. That he's writing a work of art. That he's writing a work of literature. Matthew and Mark don't strike me that way. It strikes me that they're codifying some sort of ramshackle tradition, maybe many traditions. Luke is right on the borderline. Matthew and Mark are doing something. They're doing some sort of collating. It it has sort of historical interest for me, but I would only it would only have vital interest if I were in the faith. Luke is looking at a, a phenomenon that has happened, a specifically literary phenomenon. He's the one gospel who's saying that he's writing a book. And then you get John, who is very much looking towards a living faith system, where you have to share it. And that just gets worse as, as the New Testament goes on. That just gets worse. We're, we're there, you're talking about a living faith system, which, of course, I am not a part of. So for me, Luke is the sweet spot. He is the first person to consider this not just maybe a faith tradition. I myself argue that I myself argue that the narrative voice in Luke is not Christian. <laughs> it's a little bit of a shocking thing to say. I don't I don't get any sense that the narrative voice in Luke believes any of the things that he's writing actually happened. I think I get much more the sense that he is assembling a book of what other people are writing and saying. And that that to see a gospel as a literary exercise and a fairly good one. Luke is, is fairly good. The thing that's overlooked by fundamentalist churches is what a craftsman he is. Uh, so that's that's it for him. And then Augustine, admittedly, I love I love the Kivita, I love the city of God. But of course, I was introduced to him through the Confessions, and the Confessions are like almost no other book that exists in the so-called ancient world. Of course, Augustine is the end of the ancient world, but it's like almost no other book. I you for some of the aspects of it as a book as a reading experience you have to go all the way to the diaries of Samuel Pepys to get something like the completely honest showing of the author to the reader I'm not showing you a persona of the author and I'm not making a persona out of you instead I'm in the room with you it's arresting and I I admit I, I was introduced to Augustine that way and that allowed me to just hear his voice when I read everything else of his that isn't written that way and that helps a lot. <laughs> really, that really does help a lot. No, but oh my God, my my religious reading, the people that I feel that way about, I feel that way about whoever wrote Luke. I think I know his mind a lot. 
I feel that way about Augustine, mainly because I got to know his mind in the Confessions before I read him elsewhere. I feel that way absolutely about the Venerable Bede. I feel that I that I know the man. I feel that I can almost feel how cold his writing room must have been. I, I feel the things, he's got all these documents in front of him. I feel that I must, that I kind of know what's leading him to this anecdote. Where did I find that as opposed to this one that I'm going to ignore? And that for all we know is lost. <laughs> so there, there isn't any anymore. Uh, I feel, I, I think that's it. It's probably the personal connection. I feel that I I have that personal connection. Of course, we have a gigantic library shelf of Erasmus's letters. Good God. <laughs> there, there's an enormous, enormous number of them. He was a great letter writer. Wonderful, coruscating letter writer. It's impossible not to read his collected correspondence without feeling like you know the man. So maybe that's the thread that binds all these things together, is that I, I feel like I know them. I, no matter what, no matter how heady the material is that they get into, I feel like I know them. And that makes a big difference. Could you say something about in praise of folly, and just, just what that's what that's about, and the context in which it's written, and, and why it's uh, such a wonderful text? Erasmus was an outspoken critic of the abuses of the Church of his day. He absolutely did not want a Reformation. He wanted reform. He didn't want a reformation with a capital R. He was he was the foremost critic and mocker, a very effective mocker, of the abuses of the church of his day, relics in every church. The pilgrims would line up to pay money to see a jar containing the milk of the Virgin Mary. And that milk would, of course, curdle, so the monks would refresh it with a pig every other day. And some of these things got much more elaborate than that. Some crucifixes up on the altar that would bleed if you paid and prayed and that all had to be done behind the scenes that all had to be done mechanically these, these elaborate frauds erasmus had seen enough of them he'd heard enough stories of them as he famously put it enough shards of the true cross to, to build something as big as a redwood tree I mean, he knew all of those abuses and he hated them he hated them they got in the way of the real learning it got in the way of the true faith and he excoriated them mercilessly. And he also excoriated worldly prelates, worldly priests. Uh, he himself had plenty of worldly impulses. I don't think any of them were sexual. Uh, but And that was his foremost target. But he had a lot of worldly... He liked a good meal. He liked a good class of, you know, claret or whatnot. But, uh, but he hated the excess. And to him, in his day, the, the hydrogen bomb of that kind of hypocrisy was Pope Julius II, who put on plate armor and went to war. The, the, the foremost representative of Jesus on earth, he put on plate armor, armor took on a, took up a sword, got on a war horse, and went to war. For Erasmus, that was the crisis of all crises. For a pope to do that, for, for a pope to just produce the traditions of Jesus in such a way. He also hated the, the shoddy scholarship that even some theological schools of his day were putting forward. Uh, and that all is immensely appealing to me. And he he distilled a lot of that into the praise of folly, where he has folly, the personification of foolishness, speak to an audience so that he's in a perfect position to put words in folly's mouth that he intends the reader to mock because they're they're coming from folly. They're, they're, they're being spoken by foolishness uh i'm not 100 sure if we're going to get into the weeds here on the, on the praise of folly i'm not 100 sure that he holds up that he maintains the bit all the way to the end uh i i think to a degree that made it might have made him uncomfortable erasmus liked just straightforward exhortation and he gives us books like that his incaridian is like that where he's just just talking about religious principles as they are in the real world uh, but the, at least the beginning two thirds of folly is of the folly is beautiful for that. It's just it's just wonderful for that. It's such a, I mean, it's full of the the religious concepts of its day. A, a pope who goes to war. Erasmus wrote a whole little piece called the Julius Exclusus, Julius excluded from heaven, where where the pope gets to the pearly gates and is told you can't come in here. We don't want anything to do with you. And Erasmus has to, had to deny that he wrote it. It was so explosive. He had to deny that he wrote it. Uh, 
there was that and there was also all of these uh church abuses and all those things are all over the book but i believe that despite that fact um a perceptive a reader who keeps their mind open to the subject will be able to see a very contemporary mind frame a, a very not i just shouldn't use the word contemporary because it would apply in the 1920s as well the kind of the kind of mind frame that takes things seriously but not too seriously the kind of mind frame that loves to deflate uh phonies and frauds that mind frame is very much in the praise of folly you just you, you it could do with a new translation. I guess what I'm trying to say, it could do with a new translation with a really good new introduction that just lays all this out for you. So that then you can go into the work on its own and maybe a translation that's a little less concerned with Latinate and a little more concerned with fun. <laughs> it's a funny book. If your translation isn't funny, you've translated it wrong, regardless of how accurate you've been. <laughs> and as far as I know, there are no funny English language translations of the praise of folly. <laughs> oh. I don't know if that helps to sell Erasmus. I don't think, I don't think he's a living author anymore, unfortunately. Oh, certainly it does. Thank you very much. Well, Steve, this has been so wonderful. Thank you for being so generous with your time and exploring these ideas and themes. Is there anything as we bring this to an end that you'd like to say in closing or any, anything that's still on your mind to say before we wrap this up? Well, I, I, of course, I always self-defensively want to stress what, I, what I've said a few times here, which is that when I say, I know this is going to sound really weird to say, but when I say that there are no gods and goddesses, there is no supernatural element to, to existence, I am not attacking your faith. <laughs> I know I know those two things. They don't seem like they work together at all. I hope we've made it, uh, that we've, together, we've made it somehow clear in this conversation that that is true. That is possible. I am not attacking your faith. I'm merely pointing out that it, that those things don't exist. <laughs> it doesn't really work, does it? There's no real way to do it. <laughs> You're getting something real out of them. They're allowing you to make yourself a better version of you than you think you could do without them. And that better version than you is donating money that you could use elsewhere to earthquake release. That better version of you would take me in with just a shirt on my back to live in your spare room literally as long as I need, without hesitation. Most of the, the truly religious people that I know in any denomination, any faith, would do all those things. They do routinely do all those things. Their life would be demonstrably more convenient if they didn't, but they do, and it makes them better. And they think they need that to do that. I might think not, but they do. I value that. I very much honor that. I just don't, I don't it's based on anything real. That's all. <laughs> that doesn't really work. I know. <laughs> and believe me, if we get talking about things like therapy, it'll be the same thing. <laughs> Aside from that, no, just keep reading and let me know what you're reading. <laughs> Very curious to know what you're reading. <laughs> Steve Donahue, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.